all these different technologies and ways of communicating, I think, is part of solving that problem. So I'll stop there, and I just have a really long list of people to thank, so thanks for listening.
in a lot of places in Peter Town to test it because we have empirical data that we could use to test it. But the, the more general question I think you're asking is these models, many of them are very general and not very site specific. So like I was saying before, there's much better hydrology models for, for a lot of places around the world. They're almost always better fishery models. But what we do with these is anyone anywhere can pick them up and look at five or six or seven or eight or however many services they want. And they often will swap out their, their service where they have a better model for that particular value and look at trade-offs. So we usually validate against empirical data wherever we can and often end up doing comparisons in the place with the quote better model, more sophisticated model that's been very well tested against our simpler one. So that's part of the, the validation and calibration that goes on whenever we apply these models in that particular place. So does that answer your question? Yeah, mostly. Yeah. We can talk more if you want. Yep. Um, sort of the same question in general. How much data do you actually need to have to run these models? So um, in general, that's you know there are 24 models right now. So but in general, they're they're fairly fairly um, they're always available data anywhere in the world. That's our first criterion for the model developers. So the the parameters, the number of parameters that you need to data for in the most complex model is probably 20 different data sets that are globally available, um, and then the simplest ones. Like the habitat risk assessment model, it's a, it's a model and it's a qualitative model. It's, it's pretty much using expert opinion. It's the hot day approach that they've used in Australia. So that's the range, I would say. Um, but they're changing all the time. So since they're open source, some people are adding improvements and changes to the model, which sometimes makes fewer data needs, even though it's an improvement, sometimes more. So um, yeah, it's, it's variable, I would say. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks for giving those two um, examples. My name is Eric Rosen from the USGS, and I'm actually one of the guinea pigs trying to bring the wave protection model into Cube Sound with Greg. Um, and it is tricky. You brought up a great point. There's this variability across our coastal zones and answer your question. We're putting together profiles every 200 meters or so. Um, so you can get pretty close to your target shoreline, but I have to say there's a lot of uncertainty still in how our erosion models perform. And so there's a great opportunity. Anyone wants to help work on some of these vegetation flow interactions, sediment interactions. But I guess my question is, when you get to the point where you're trying to get some of these local jurisdictions to use this information, the thing we're coming up against is they really want find certainty on these predictions. And so it comes down to being able to show error bars and some level of confidence to these future predictions and the influence of eel grass and salt marsh on wave showing. Do you have any, um, you've got some great examples from internationally that communities are trying to accept this. Um, are there any other lessons learned we can look for to inform these in the community how to use some of this information in an effective way. Trends are all towards more sea level rise, more erosion typically. So you think there's enough to work on? Yeah. But it's hard unless you can show them. Yeah, so I think that's a really great point is that this, you know, in a decision process, these models typically are going to end up where they can't provide the, the, as, as much precision as a decision maker wants. And I think the coastal erosion and flooding one is the one we often hear the most kind of feedback that you're getting. So they're, they're very early stage, look at broad trade-offs across services and where along a shoreline or out in the ocean are there likely to be conflicts or trade-offs. That's where the main use of these models comes in. If you want to do a, a, an advice for, you know, a city saying where should I put my bulkhead or where should I not put my bulkhead, you quickly, as you're finding these models, and you kind of reach their limitation unless we can get better local estimates. But they're really not designed to be used at that really fine scale. Um, 
I think you're pushing it, which is great, and, and Greg, I know, is working with you and other people in other places to try to see how, how far can we take them, because the coastal erosion models in particular, there, there don't tend to be better examples out there where you have natural habitats in them. So they're not like fisheries and hydrology models where there are better cases, but coastal protection ones are novel in that way. So I hope we do keep pushing that to get a finer scale and better estimates. There's a new uncertainty module, I don't know if you've seen that, that lets people do Monte Carlo's on these and generate errors. So if you haven't tried that, it might be worth trying with your, your thing. I'm glad you're still doing that. That's great. Dan? Just a bit of a follow-up question. Right now, it seems like the approach is to pretend the science does provide the optimal solution or investment, and we can work on reducing uncertainties or increasing precision. The alternative way to do it is to ask what's the most robust strategy, given that some of those uncertainties will never end up going away. And in fact, some of those uncertainties can actually increase as we move into a warmer, warmer world, for instance. Mm -hmm. Given the uncertainties in these various physical or even economic uh, relationships, what's the best thing that you can do that's going to be better than random, but it's going to be robust to the uncertainties that probably aren't the best? Yeah, I, so I think what you just described is a really good way to sort of characterize what really happens in the ultimate decision. So I've showed you a lot of model results here. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, like even in Belize, those were only three services, and there are a lot of other considerations that the Belizeans are using to figure out where do they allow what activities where. So there's a lot of discussion that the, the ministers in that case and different partners we work with, where they talk about how risk averse are they, what are the sort of no-brainer kind of um, activities or allow, not allow kind of things they should be including. So, it, we, but we haven't systematized it in the way you're talking about, but I think there's the, the discussions in this iterative science policy process are r really along the lines that you're talking about because this model part that I'm showing you is they don't base their whole decision obviously on these results. I mean, there's a lot of other discussion. And we spend a lot of time talking about how heuristic these are and they're really just showing where conflicts might occur what the trade-offs might be, where you can get maybe minimizing trade-offs. It's very general sort of comp, sort of ending advice. No one's taking these and saying, I'm going to have, you know, 500 meters more shoreline in this scenario than this one, so I'm going with that answer. It just, they, they kind of know or we help them understand that that's not the way these, these would be interpreted. But it would be, it would be interesting to take your you know, just like think more more um, systematically about that decision process and what other factors come into it and how could we shift the discussion in a more organized way. That, that's a good thought. Yeah. This is maybe taking a step back further. We have the diversity of projects that you work on. How do you feel about determining who the stakeholders are and setting what those objectives are? Yeah, that's a great point. So that's the beauty of this um, NGO academic partnership. So the NGOs usually introduce us to their decision-making group on the ground, and sometimes the, the NATCAP um, people working will say, "Oh, we need a couple other stakeholders here because we need to know about, you know, who are the ranchers in this area, or who are the who are the people who are putting in wind energy permits or wave energy permits, for example." But most all of that has already been convened before we were asked in to come provide these um, accounting tools. So that, yeah, because that's really important and really time consuming. And identifying the objectives is a really important step, and we do help a lot with that. We, but the group has been convened, and that convening the group is the hard, slow part, I would say. Yeah.
Yeah, we've gotten a lot of really great feedback on that, and we have, I didn't show you, we have this whole sort of um, uncertainty toolbox that we use, and a lot of it is very interactive. People can play and move stuff around and see how they change, so it kind of is like a, a sensitivity analysis by the users in a way, so that's one thing that a lot of people really like. Um, but yeah, there's also apparently, someone was just telling me the other day, and one of our postdocs has played with this now, there are some mapping techniques to show uncertainty and map outputs that we're also feeling is much more technical. So there's a, a whole range, I think it's a whole great area to pursue, is like how do people perceive uncertainty and what's the best way to show it because we end up explaining it through our dialogue, but if we could also reinforce it better in the way we show, it would be great. So I think there's, yeah, we'd love any help. Okay, that's <coughs> that's it for questions, but please, please feel free to ask Mary any other ones at the reception. Um, join us next week at the same time. Christian Zinnerman will be here. Um, he's going to be presenting a talk entitled Science and Public Policy, <coughs> Ostriches, Opportunities, and Why Our Political Discourse Fails to Reflect Urgent Realities. Um, so again, there'll be a reception. And thank you.